Welcome to The Big Picture with Katrina Fulcher Rood and Ani Castilla Earls, where they discuss how research in speech language pathology can be implemented in daily clinical practice. Welcome, everybody, to the second episode of The Big Picture. And this vlog, this is where we talk about research in the area of speech language pathology and how speech language pathologists can begin to use that research in their everyday clinical practice. I'm Katrina Fulcher Rood. And I am Annie Castilla Earls. And with this being only our second interview, we thought that we would just give you some updates about who we are and how we're going to be really using this vlog and what's going to be happening. So we mentioned in the first episode that I used to work here at SUNY Fredonia, but now I am working for the University of Houston. So that puts a big limitation in how we're going to get this done, mainly because I live in Houston, Texas. And I'm here in Buffalo, New York. So for now, we have a plan for at least 10 episodes of how we're going to make this happen, but this is a work in progress and sometimes you will not see the two of us together. And so what we're going to do is we are going to have an episode a week, so please make sure that you're coming back, checking here on the YouTube channel each week to see what we're offering. The majority of the time you'll be seeing both of us, but when we have those geographic uh, barriers, you're going to be seeing some of our great special guests. So we're going to be having some of our other university colleagues, as well as local speech language pathologists in our area, talking about some of their big picture items. So Ani, how do you want to start us off on this second episode? So let's remind you that we are both clinicians. This is what we do, we love doing this, we are also researchers, but we always keep our clinician hat on. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one of the questions that I get asked more often because of my area of research with monolingual children, with English speaking children, and is those borderline children. And we also see it in our research. So let's see, what is a borderline child for us in our research? So when we're talking to speech language pathologists and they're explaining these borderline cases, those are the cases that are hitting around an 85 standard score. So they're that one standard deviation below. They might fall in the 84 range or they might fall in that 86 range. They're borderline. We don't know what to do with them. Are they mildly language impaired? Should they be within normal limits? And that really impacts us as speech pathologists because can we give them treatment services? Should they have treatment services? So there's a lot of assessment questions that really come along when you have those borderline cases. Now that you mentioned that, I want to remind you to stay tuned for further episodes when we're going to talk about beyond standardized assessment because a standardized assessment is only one of the tools that we use for assessment, but we know because of our own research that Clinicians, SLPs across the country are using a lot of standardized assessment for many reasons. One is because of policies at the state level about qualification for services. Um, they are easy to administer. They are comprehensive. They test the skills that you guys want them to test. So we understand the use of standardized testing. So a child that has a score that we put so much emphasis on, right? A standard is a score of 85 is always like, what are we going to do in mm -hmm. this case? So you can find two, two of these cases, two completely different epi uh, scenarios. So for example, I have found children who have a low score on a test, but no one is worried, or there is no any indication of what's happening with this child. Maybe someone is worried, maybe the mom is worried at home, but at school, the child is performing normal, things seem to be okay, but the score is low. And you can also find the opposite, right? I found the opposite too, where I have standardized scores that are leaning more towards that within normal limits category, where we wouldn't typically recommend services, we might not diagnose as language impaired, but when we're looking at that other information, a parent or a teacher is concerned, or we go in and we do that classroom observation and it seems like they're not following along and we're getting indications that classroom performance is hindered. But we have that standard score that show that looks like this child's within normal limits. Mm -hmm. Correct. So we're gonna see about we're gonna talk about two possible approaches that we can use to figure out what's going on with that child and in particular with that score. Mm -hmm. Why is this child receiving this score? Um, so the first thing that we're going to discuss is every test 
well, not every test, but some of the tests that we use that are more comprehensive, such as the PLS, the self, the self preschool, for example, will give you some information in their manuals about their own sensitivity and specificity. So these two measures are measures of diagnostic accuracy, how good this test is to identify children with language impairments. So we have these two words again, sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is the ability of a test to identify correctly those children with language impairments. Mm -hmm. On the opposite side, you have a specificity. Specificity is the ability of a test to identify those children who are typically developing. Okay. So now, why is this important to know? What about if you find a test that it's not good at identifying children with language impairments? You should, of course, try to find a better tool to get your job done, mm -hmm. correct? Okay, so I brought us an example today, one test that is commonly used in our area. So this is the PLS 5, the newest edition. Mm -hmm. And both of us have used this. I know I've used this in my clinical work. I use it a lot for research purposes. <laughs> What is interesting is in the same manual, so this is not something that we are coming up with, in their own manual, they will tell you about their own sensitivity and their own specificity of the test. So I'm going to refer to the examiner's manual, you're going to go to page 91 if you have it at work and you want to review where is that mm -hmm. I'm directing my attention to. And in the manual they will tell you that the sensitivity of the PLS5 is 0.83 and the specificity is 0 0.80. So let's see what that means. Mm -hmm. So the specificity being a 0 0.83, I'm sorry, the specificity being a 0 0.80, it means that in 80% of the cases, when the test tells you that the child is normal, the test is actually correct. But there is an opposite side to that, right, Kat? What's happening with that other 20%? What, do, what does that mean if it's only 80% specificity? I want to know about that 20%. Well, the other 20%, when they receive a score, when they are normal, they might receive a score as language impaired. So there is a margin of error there. So there might be some typically developing children that are actually being labeled based on that score as language impaired. Correct. And we'd be over-diagnosing in that case. Absolutely. And it's also the same, it's a similar scenario the other case. The manual says that the sensitivity of the PLS is 0.83. So in 83% of the cases, when the PLS tells you that the child has a language disorder, you can trust the PLS. But there is again, what percentage of children? 17%. <laughs> All the children are being misdiagnosed based on only one tool. So yes, I know we put a lot of trust into this task. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Um, but I think we as clinicians should be very cautious of how we use this. Um, they are not hiding from us that they are not perfect at identifying. I actually don't think we have any tool that is 100% mm -hmm. accurate in identifying language disorders. So it is important to know that there are some cases in that they are not doing what we think they are doing. So this is clearly an issue for us speech pathologists to be worried about. We don't want to overdiagnose. We don't want to underdiagnose. So what is the big picture? How can we take what we just learned about sensitivity and specificity and really put that to our daily assessment use? Well, now you can use these two indicators that I usually identify in your test to make your case with your IEP at your IEP meeting, for example, right? You can say, look, the score is 87, but we know that there's a percentage of error uh, in the power of the PLS to identify children with language impairment. So even though this is the score that they are saying, my instinct and my other pieces of information, my, cl my clinical judgment is telling me a different story, right? So you can refer to that. There are other ways to do it though, Kat. I, and I was just going to mention those because sometimes even when I've brought up this idea of error in a test, uh, that's maybe not something that's been as well received by other members on my team and that there's some really strict criteria that I have to hold onto that standard score and use that for interpretation. So are there other ways that I could potentially interpret that score to help with those two cases that we talked about in the beginning? Yes. So we left with this idea that a test, that a number is truly going to represent the language skills of a child, right? Mm -hmm. That 100, that 97, that 68 is telling you as who that child is. That is a not very realistic idea because that is just a little bit of the information 
of what that child can do in real language, mm -hmm. in real life with their language. And the test developers, they know that too, right? And when they say 85 or 87 or anything, any number within the range, they are also aware that there is some measurement error. Everything that we do has some measurement error implied into that because measurement of the skills, language skills, behaviors is not perfect. So we always encounter error. So have you seen the confidence intervals that are on your test? Have you seen them before? I've seen them before. Right? <laughs> Our students ask us all the time, what are those numbers? On what the are the confidence intervals? What does it mean? How Should do I, I look use at it? it? <laughs> Should I look at it? And now we are like, well, you definitely need to look at it. So I'm referring again to the PLS. In this, at this time, I'm, I am in the administration and the scoring manual of the PLS. There are two different books. Um, and I'm in page 163, and I'm just referring to any scores in particular. What is interesting here is, for example, when they give you a score of 99, that is a standard score, then there is also a column next to it that says 90%. And within that 90%, they have a range between 94 and 104. What that means is at the 90% confidence interval, you can have be like something like 90% sure that your score is within that range. Meaning it's not 99, it's that score is within that range. So my actual true score falls within a range. Falls within a range, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a number. It cannot really be a number. It's like you can think as a range. Now, at the 99% level, it doesn't matter as much. Do you want to take a look at the ID, at the 85%, at the 85 score? Let's take that look because we know those borderline cases are really difficult for Going us. Going back to our borderline cases. So, when your standard score is 85, at the 90% confidence interval, your range is between 81 and 91. So that means my true score falls somewhere in between that 81 range and that 91 range. By the PLS uses 85 to identify a child with language impairment. So what do you do then? Well, that child, potentially if you have that range and they're falling and you have some information that's indicating that they have lower language skills, parents are concerned, teachers are concerned, they're not uh, operating or functioning as well in the classroom, we can argue that they could potentially be at the around that 81 standard score, which would be in that mild uh, language impairment range and could potentially help you actually identify somebody for services. Correct, absolutely. And that is definitely a tool that you can use in your clinical practice. So Kat, what's the big picture of today? The big picture of today is to realize that standardized tests have errors. And they're upfront about those errors in the manual, and we wanna make sure that we're not over or under diagnosing. So make sure that you're looking at that sensitivity and specificity. And Ani, if we have a case uh, that we do need to use those standard scores because that's what district and other individuals expect of me, what's another way that I could interpret that standard score? You can also use the confidence intervals to see what is your range of scores, because it's not only one, it's a range. So next time, our invitation for you is next time you're assessing a child and you see that big number, whatever it is, low or high, wonder about the error. What is the error associated with that number? And hopefully you will comment on this post. What are some ways that they can give us feedback, Ted? We would love to hear from you, to hear what are some of your big picture items when we're talking about standardized tests, scoring standardized tests, interpreting standardized tests. So feel free to email us at thebigpicturevlog at gmail.com or you can go right below and comment uh, right here on this YouTube video. And we'll try our best to reply to your comments and to be responsive to what you say. And you might even be featured on an episode where we can bring the comments back to you and have them as a discussion point here on The Big Picture. So thanks so much for joining us and we hope to see you at episode three. And remember, always keep thinking about the big picture. <laughs>